Hello and welcome. My name is Mary Hawksworth and I'm the Director of Marketing at ATCOR. We're going to go through a couple of logistics before we get started. Uh, first, if you have questions, please use your GoToWebinar uh, panel. You can ask questions that way and at the end of the session we'll have time for a few questions and we will be able to pull them up from the control panel there. If your question isn't answered during the session, we will answer it directly afterward. Also, the webinar is being recorded and we will send a link to the recording later today. So I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Nicole Weinberg of the Pacific Heart Institute who is hosting today. I'll give a little background on Dr. Weinberg. She grew up in New Jersey and attended Emory University in Atlanta where she graduated cum laude with a Bachelor of Science degree in Honors Biology. She received her medical degree from MCP Hahnemann University School of Medicine, which is now part of Drexel University, and completed her residency at Thomas Jefferson School of Medicine. She completed her cardiology fellowship at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. And Dr. Weinberg has published extensively in subjects ranging from imaging modalities to evaluation of cardiac disease. She's lectured locally on preventative heart disease and women's heart disease, and is also part of the Women's Health Initiative at St. John's Hospital. Dr. Weinberg is a longtime SphygmaCore user and expert, and we welcome her as the host of Advancing Hypertension Management in Women today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, we're going to focus today on hypertension in women. And as it relates to our female patient population, there are so many different factors that affect blood pressure in our female patients. And one of the most obvious to point out is hormonal changes. And so during the course of a woman's menstrual cycle, there are different hormone changes that exist. Around ovulation, women's blood pressures start to rise and right around the time of menstruation, that's generally the peak blood pressure time during the course of the month for women. As this relates to different therapies for hormones in women, many women that are on birth control or hormone replacement therapy will note blood pressure changes such that some of their therapies may need to be modified. Some people that are on birth control pills need to be on progesterone only or have their dosages changed or lowered if they're having some blood pressure changes. Additionally, as it relates to treatments for different disease processes in women, they may be undergoing treatments for breast cancer or osteoporosis, and the treatments associated with these disease processes may affect their blood pressure. Many of us are familiar with anthracyclines causing cardiotoxicity, radiation causing some changes in the vasculature, and all of these things have been shown to affect blood pressure in women. Additionally, and significantly, there are a lot of women that have emotional changes and anxieties that cause blood pressures to elevate, and within this subset, white coat hypertension is something that is quite significant for our female patients coming into the office. A lot of women may experience some adrenaline surges or anxieties coming into the doctor's office that cause their blood pressures to be higher when a practitioner is checking their numbers. So looking at all of these factors together in our female population makes us want to treat them in a little bit of a different way. So if you look at central pressure and arterial stiffness in women, there have been numerous studies that have demonstrated the clinical significance of this. So if you look at women who are undergoing breast cancer treatments or have complications in their pregnancies such as pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, if you look at women that are being treated for osteoporosis or have had polycystic ovarian syndrome, you can see differences in their arterial stiffness that will be very clinically significant for your individualized care of these patients because they have these disease processes and we want to make sure that their vascular health is well maintained for a long period of time. So if we look at hypertension management, traditionally we check a brachial blood pressure, but really that's not the most vital measurement. Central blood pressure is the number that we have checked over time to be most consistent with showing that 
people are having problems with their vital organs. So the central aortic pressures are the things that tell us what this patient's risk is for stroke, heart attack, and renal failure. It's very difficult to stick wires and catheters into the heart every day to be able to track those numbers. So the brachial blood pressure has historically been the measure that we have used as a surrogate marker of the central blood pressure. But as you can see based on this slide, patients can have very similar brachial blood pressures and have quite a change in their central blood pressures. And it is for these reasons that we want to understand what patients' central blood pressures are, treat them differently, and give them different therapeutic remedies so that they can not have arterial stiffness associated with this disease process. So if you look at this large study of patients that were looked at that had high normal blood pressures with brachial blood pressures ranging from 130 to 139, or stage 1 hypertension patients that have blood pressures of 140 to 159, you can see that with their brachial blood pressures as they were, there is about a 70% overlap in their central systolic blood pressure. So if you look at all the patients that were in this overlapped section, there were a large percentage that were being either over-treated or under-treated because this study was focusing on treating brachial blood pressure, not central blood pressure. Additionally, as it relates to different medication therapies, there are different effects which will end up changing the clinical outcomes based on the different medications that patients are placed on. So in the CAFE study, which was a subset of the ASCOT study, they looked at patients that were on both atenolol and amlodipine. And these patients had very similar brachial systolic blood pressures. But when you looked at their central pressures, the patients in the amlodipine arm had quite a significantly lower central blood pressure and also had a lower adverse clinical event rate based on this finding. Additionally, if you look at end organ effects and how it relates to different antihypertensive therapies, this study looked at two different kinds of beta blockers. It looked at patients on metoprolol and nabivolol, and it showed that there were similar reductions in both heart rate and brachial blood pressure in both of these drugs, but that the central blood pressure was substantially decreased in the vasodilating nabivolol group. And the metoprolol group really didn't change very much at all. So as that translated into the left ventricular relative wall thickness, you can see that the nabivolol group also had a statistically significant lowering of their wall thickness associated with being on this drug that the metoprolol group did not have. And that's correlative with the fact that their central pressures were lower in the nabivolol group. So what can we learn from the morphology of the central pressure waveform and be able to use this to guide our individualized therapy? So for understanding the aortic pressure wave contour, we are going to look at the incident wave first, which is as the heart beats and generates out this waveform, you can see that the incident waveform goes up during systole and then travels down. As if it's traveling in a tube, it won't, it'll just continue on forward. But as we know from the arterial tree, there are lots of bifurcations, vessel narrowing, and other sources of impedance that occur that cause this incident wave as it's going out to be reflected back. When you sum up the incident and the reflective waveforms together, you'll get this aortic pressure waveform that has both the incident and reflective waveforms together. And it is this physiology that we study when we're looking at our patients. So the arterial stiffness can be impacted based on the late and early wave reflections. And if we look at the late wave reflection, you can see that there is a lower pressure wave that is coming back. And so this patient would have 
lower arterial stiffness versus an early wave reflection as the wave is coming back and it's amplifying quite high, this patient would have um, an elevated arterial stiffness. So the impact of this early wave reflection is actually very clinically significant. The central blood pressure the central pulse pressure rises quite significantly with the early wave reflection, and it's this increased central pulse pressure that increases patients' risks of stroke and renal failure. Additionally, there's an increased left ventricular load, which increases the left ventricular mass, causes hypertrophy of the heart, and ultimately heart failure. And additionally, with the early wave reflection as it's coming back, it's a bit lower in diastole, and this decreases perfusion to the coronary arteries and increases that risk of myocardial ischemia in patients. So as you can see, with the early wave reflection, there's a lot of clinically significant disease states that can occur. So if we're just going to look at the different parameters that we're going to be measuring in our clinical cases, the augmentation pressure is the first number that we're going to look at, and this is the contribution of the reflective wave to the central pulse pressure that we saw with the incident wave. So this is the amplification, excuse me, the augmentation of the wave um, with the reflective waveform. Additionally, there's the central pulse pressure, which is the height of that summation wave, and when we look at the augmentation pressure divided by that central pulse pressure, we're going to be measuring the augmentation index. And this is also an important parameter as we're looking at patient cases. So how does this information help guide our patient therapies and managements? So we look at patients in three different categories as it relates to this individualized hypertension management. We have our pre or our mild hypertensive patients, our intermediate risk hypertensive patients, and our more complex cases. So for our pre and mild hypertensive patients, we're trying to decide are we going to be treating these patients or not treating these patients? Is there a lifestyle modification that can be done? Do we want to start low dose therapy for these patients? How are we going to make sure that they do not end up with arterial stiffness related to the disease? As it relates to our intermediate risk hypertensive patients, we're going to be looking for a more individualized approach. For example, what medication are we going to be starting? Are we going to be adding a second or a third drug? If so, what's it going to be? And then for our complex cases, we're going to be more directing care to the individual physiology, such as a patient with congestive heart failure or advanced coronary disease. How are these different therapies going to help this patient to not have progression of their disease? So this is the assessment of the therapy effectiveness that we're going to be looking at after we do some treatments for these individualized groupings. So for hypertension management, we're going to want to look at the central arterial waveform. And this is going to give us this individualized hypertension management. So if we're just looking at these two cases to start, these are both young women, 38-year-old females, with brachial blood pressures that are quite similar, 151 over 82 and 152 over 80. But you can see that their waveforms are quite dramatically different, and it's because there's a difference in arterial stiffness as it relates to these two cases. So for the patient on the top, a lot of her central pressures as well as her different parameters fall into a normal range. But for the gal on the bottom, her central pressures are very abnormal. And this is somebody that we would want to identify and treat. She may be a patient that had a history of preeclampsia that caused some advanced arterial stiffness. And subsequently, she's left with a disease state that needs to be modified so that she does not end up in her later years having the effects of this hypertension and cardiovascular disease. So if we use this information and start with our cases, we're going to look at our first case, which is the patient with hypertension and significant arterial stiffness. 
So this patient is a 54-year-old diabetic female. Her baseline brachial blood pressure is 154 over 83. Her central blood pressure is 149 over 84. And if you look at her waveform for her peripheral blood pressure versus her central blood pressure, and you compare her numbers side by side, the one striking difference that comes up is that her peripheral or brachial systolic blood pressure is not significantly amplified compared to her arterial, excuse me, her aortic systolic blood pressure. It's only up by five millimeters of mercury, which is not very significant. Additionally, this woman's pulse pressure at 65 is quite significant, and we generally would want that parameter to be less than 50. So if we spend a bit of time and look at this case and her central waveform, we can compare her numbers against other age and gender matched controls over here. And we can see that her aortic systolic pressure at 149 is quite significantly above her upper limits of normal at 127. Additionally, her aortic pulse pressure at 65 is quite elevated compared to the upper limits of normal of 48. And her augmented pressure at 26 is quite high compared to her upper limits of normal at 18. And the only number that does fall into a normal range is her augmentation index, but truly it's at the upper limits of normal. So for this patient with all of these numbers being quite elevated, she is somebody that we would want to be quite aggressive with, with her management. We would want to be treating her with medication so that this disease process of hypertension does not continue to progress. So for this gal in my practice, I would put her on an angiotensin receptor blocker and we would follow her over time. So her follow-up on this 53-year-old diabetic female at the 16-week follow-up mark, we can see with this angiotensin receptor blocker, her brachial blood pressure gets reduced from 154 over 83 to 120 over 76. So that's great blood pressure lowering on the arm, but what is it doing centrally? So her central blood pressures do decrease quite substantially as well. And we can see that her waveforms below show that her aortic systolic pressure goes down to 112, and that does have quite a substantial amplification as it relates to her brachial blood pressure at 120. Additionally, her pulse pressure difference drops to 36, which is also in a normal range and very excellent reduction being on this medication. And when we look at her central waveform, and we look at the numbers from her central waveform as they are matched against her age and gender match controls, all of her numbers are in a normal range now. So this woman has gotten adequate treatment uh, of her disease process, and hopefully her condition of arterial stiffness will be better as things move forward. So for case two, this is a patient who's having elevated blood pressures, but has age normal arterial stiffness. So she's a 42-year-old diabetic female who comes into the office and has brachial blood pressures of 155 over 99. But if you look at her central blood pressure waveform and the numbers that are derived, you can see that she has very significant amplification of her aortic systolic pressure that is measured at 140 to her brachial systolic pressure at 155. Additionally, her pulse pressure number is 40, which is definitely in a good range and less than 50, which is when we start to get a bit more concerned. So if we focus on this woman's central aortic waveform and we look at her measurements, all of her numbers as they relate to her age matched controls fall into a normal range except for her aortic systolic pressure. 
So for this patient, there may be some other influencing factor that's contributing to that central aortic pressure being quite elevated. This may be a patient that does have some element of white coat hypertension. This may be a patient who hasn't been exercising very much or has some dietary issues that could be modified because at this time, really the only parameter that's elevated in her is her aortic systolic pressure. The rest of her arterial stiffness parameters are all normal. So for this patient, if she came into my office, I would probably give her the option of lifestyle modifications and ask her to modify her diet or exercise more in the hopes of modifying this systolic, uh, aortic systolic pressure. So if she follows up 16 weeks later, we can see that she has decreased her brachial blood pressure to 132 over 85. And she's also had quite a substantial drop in her central blood pressure. Now she's at 123. She has also maintained very good amplification of her blood pressures and still has a low pulse pressure. So when we look at her central blood pressure waveform, and again compare her numbers to her age and gender match controls, her aortic systolic pressure that was quite elevated before is now only one point above what we would consider to be a normal range for her, and the rest of her parameters are all still in a normal range. So for this patient, you could either say that she has achieved very good results thus far and ask if perhaps these lifestyle modifications can be continued such that she would continue to work on lowering that aortic systolic pressure with dietary and lifestyle modifications so that we can continue to keep her blood vessels and her arterial stiffness in a good and normal range. So for case three, we're going to work on having a more improved understanding of our prehypertensive patient. So this is a 65-year-old diabetic female who has blood pressures that are only slightly elevated at 136 over 73. But when you look at her central blood pressure waveform and her numbers, you can see that she very much does not amplify her aortic pressure. She goes from only 132 to 136 brachially, so only a difference of four millimeters of mercury. Additionally, her pulse pressure difference is 59, and we're already on alert because it's greater than 50. So looking at her central waveform and looking at the numbers that come out and comparing them against her age and gender match controls, you can see that this patient is in a bad way. Her numbers are quite elevated. She has significant arterial stiffness. And she is somebody that you would want to get to and try to lower these numbers because there's a lot of potential to drive these numbers down. But she has more risk than you actually realize based on her brachial blood pressure that's really only mildly elevated. So for a patient like this who is diabetic, 65 and has these arterial stiffness parameters, I would probably want to be very aggressive with her lifestyle modifications and start with some medical interventions. In case four, we're also going to look at a prehypertensive patient who's 41 and diabetic. Her brachial blood pressure is not very different from case three. She's up, got a blood pressure of 135 over 84. Her central blood pressure is 121 over 85, and you can see her waveform here looks quite different than the last gal's waveform. You can see, in contrast to case three, that this patient has a quite significant amplification of her aortic systolic pressure. Additionally, her pulse pressure is 36, so it's in a good range. And when you look at her numbers against her other age and gender match controls, you can see that she doesn't have anything in the red. Only her aortic systolic pressure is at the upper limits of normal, but still all of her other parameters are in a normal range. 
So it makes you appreciate that there's a substantial difference between case three and case four when their brachial blood pressures are really quite similar. So this is a patient who is prehypertensive, but she is actually low risk compared to the gal in case three. So in summary, if we're looking at our patients and we're trying to individualize their care, understanding their brachial blood pressure is not going to be enough. Understanding their central pressure waveform is gonna help us to individualize our therapy, understand what patients are at better at risk for disease, and then manage these patients more completely. We're also gonna be able to get a better understanding of how they fare over time with their treatments, their lifestyle modifications, and their disease process, so that we can hopefully be able to initiate the correct therapies, change their therapies, and monitor them over time so that we reduce the risk of the disease. Thank you very much. Okay, great, thank you. We're gonna go uh, take a few questions now. Can read that one. Okay. So uh, the first question is, how often do you test patients once you've made lifestyle modifications or treatment changes? So what I generally do is I check patients after we've done something within three to four months, because especially with lifestyle modifications, it's going to take a little while for them to amp up to an exercise regimen or dietary changes. Additionally, with medications, there may be a titration of the dosage or there may be some side effects that occur initially. So giving them a little bit of time on the medication to get started um, and then having them come back at three to four months is when I would do the first check. And then thereafter, it depends on the advancements that they've made, how well they feel, how we're faring in terms of their numbers moving forward. Okay, so uh, the next question is, how often does the sphygma core result change the treatment for your patients? I would say that the results of the sphygma core generally changes our management in probably between 30 and 40% of our patients. Um, I'm oftentimes quite surprised uh, at the readings that I get um, when patients come through and they say that they have been told that their blood pressures are elevated and they're worried about their risks of disease. Um, I think it's also a very motivating factor as they see their numbers come through and they understand that this is something that's a very objective marker for them and then they can follow this over time um, as we change their lifestyle, their exercise, or their medications. All right, so the next question is, do you find that patients seem more compliant once they've seen positive results or trends with sphygma core? I would say absolutely. I think it's actually quite validating as it relates to um, the patients having this objective data that really validates how they're faring in terms of their therapies and treatments. Um, I have a gal who has been working on this exercise and weight loss regimen, and she wants to have her measurements done because it proves to her that she's on the right track in terms of modifying her risks of disease. So I think knowing these objective results is almost better than seeing some of the weight loss or seeing the brachial blood pressure change, the things that the patient can see at home. This looks on the inside. Okay, so um, last question. Um, how do you know when the central blood pressure is contributing significantly to the hypertension? So as it relates to the central waveform, I look at the different parameters that come out based on the central waveform, and then we 
the computer looks at those against their age match controls and gender match controls, and we can see if these patients, based on those numbers, are in a situation where they're actually causing damage to their, to their arterial system. So when we're looking at these numbers, we can find out how significant their hypertension or their brachial blood pressure readings are to their central uh, blood pressure, their arterial waveforms, and their risks of cardiovascular disease. Okay, I think that was all of our questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. We'll conclude the session now, and thank you so much, Dr. Weinberg. We appreciate it. Everyone have a great day.